right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and I know we do have a bunch of groups joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I wanna say a huge thank you to all our teachers again, uh, whether you're joining us live or on YouTube, I know it's a really odd time to be a teacher, so we really appreciate you joining us as we continue to showcase such amazing people and places around the globe. So January, was our entire month dedicated to STEM careers. We did 35 broadcasts featuring all sorts of really cool people, and now we are diving into February, where we're beginning the month with this program, which is a little bit different than the rest of our programs. As many of our teachers may know, February is all about celebrating incredible women in science and technology and exploration. So all month long, incredible women coming at you. We kick out all the men, it's kind of fun. Um, and one big thing I wanna highlight to begin the broadcast for all our groups tuning in, February 12th through 14th, we have our Women Blaze Trails Festival. 50 programs, three days, all showcasing incredible women across the globe. It's all weekend long, every 30 minutes, a new speaker. So I'd encourage you to check out that website when you're done this broadcast. But today we're going on a virtual field trip. So we are joined live by Carly. She is at the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, and she is gonna talk to us today about Monarch Nation along with a few colleagues. So we're gonna learn all about Monarchs, some of the amazing work the TRCA is doing, and see them up close and personal. So without further ado, Carly, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. Just unmute that mic and you're good to go. <laughs> Perfect. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Um, as Jesse said, my name is Carly and I work for Toronto and Region Conservation Authority um, from Toronto, Ontario. And I like to think of my job, I am in a big eco team or a part of a big eco team where we really just care about the environment and especially encouraging others like yourself, students to get outside um, and see how they can help. So, um, Usually what I do is I'm in the classroom and I get to touch base with different students of all ages, but very happy to be here virtually today to uh, be talking to you. Um, another part of my job is I also um, am a part of Monarch Nation. Um, and Monarch Nation is a three-year program focusing on education for children uh, to deliver programming about species at risk uh, throughout Canada. Um, uh, we talk about uh, monarchs specifically, but also other species at risk. Um, we have partners across Canada and we try to involve children um, in every aspect across the province and territories. Um, I'm not the only one here today to discuss monarchs with you. I also have two friends who will introduce themselves. So Andalyn, you can start first. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Andalyn. I'm the naturalist at Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory. So I'm coming to you from Cambridge, Ontario, and I work in a tropical greenhouse filled with butterflies. I brought some of them here with me today and we're gonna meet them a little bit later on. Thanks, Carly. And we also have Will who I work with. Hello everybody, my name is Will Sorley. I'm an educator just like Carly with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Uh, I'm here to help out in our YouTube chat to answer any questions. So you might've seen me chat earlier about the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. I'll be answering questions there, but I also have some really cool things to show you up close with a microscope later as well. Awesome, thanks so much. So we're gonna get started with just a PowerPoint to help guide you through this. And I promise we're gonna bring back those live monarchs and put them under a microscope so you can get even a closer look. Um, but let's first start off by why monarchs? Why do we care about them? And why are we so interested in them? Well, they are very iconic. Uh, monarch butterflies are one of the most iconic and cherished insects in North America. Um, really, they're famous for not only their color, you probably have been able to see a monarch and identify it really easily. They have those bright orange wings um, with black and white spots there. Um, but they're also seasonal, um, they migrate. And millions of monarchs migrate from the United States and Canada south to Mexico for the winter. So monarchs are, they hold the record for the longest known insect migration on the planet. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that more. Um, but as we think about that, they fly almost 4,800 kilometers to reach their winter home. Um, and that's not so bad for being the tiny little insect they are. 
Um, but we want to think about what is a species at risk and, and why do we care? Well, species at risk, monarchs are not the only ones who are identified as a species at risk. Um, a species at risk is an animal that's just having a really hard time uh, in the wild. They may be struggling to find food or somewhere to live safely, uh, so they just might need our help. Um, there's other species in Canada specifically. We have the barn owl, polar bears, the little brown bat, um, rusty patch bumblebee, and the western coarse frogs that are all species that are just needing our help. The monarch butterflies are seen throughout Ontario and um, usually in the summer months. Uh, we can see them as early as May and even in October, early October, if the weather is warm enough. Um, but for the winter, as I said, they migrate to Mexico. Um, if they're uh, east of the Rockies, that would be to Mexico, or west of the Rockies uh, in California. In recent years, this has been a declining number. We've seen less and less uh, monarchs around, and again, that has to do directly with habitats. Now, the monarch butterfly has a very special habitat that they rely on. Um, they only lay their eggs on one type of plant, and they actually only eat one type of plant as a caterpillar, um, and that plant is milkweed. Milkweed is the only plant that monarch caterpillars will feed on, um, and in recent years, it's been quite scarce in North America. Um, sometimes people uh, you know, with developments and human activity, we, we tend to clear that uh, milkweed away and there isn't l enough left for uh, monarchs to survive. So let's touch on the monarch life cycle. Monarchs, um, as we know, they're not just butterflies, they go through something called metamorphosis. Uh, and that's a rig really big, scary word, metamorphosis, but it is something that means that these animals go through different life stages and they look different at each of these stages. Um, as you know, like any butterfly, those uh, monarchs or butterflies will start off as an egg and then they move to the second stage we call this larva or a caterpillar um, we also then move to the pupa stage or in this case would be a chrysalis and then to the beautiful adult monarch butterfly uh, monarchs take about one month to go from an egg to an adult just depending on temperature and climate and there's some other uh, factors there like food so diving in again, that milkweed is a very important aspect of uh, the monarch uh, population and, and their survival. So as we say, monarchs will lay their eggs on milkweed because it's the only suitable host that once they uh, hatch out or emerge from their egg, they need to be able to find that food source. Um, there are three main species here in Ontario uh, that we have of milkweed and that's common milkweed, butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed. Uh, and milkweed, that's kind of a funny name, but it actually has a, a reason for that. Um, you can see in that picture there on the left-hand side, if you were to see the inside of milkweed or snap it open, it has this um, milky sap and that's where it gets its uh, name from. Um, but what's noted is this is actually toxic and the monarch butterfly can consume it safely. And over time, it actually makes them poisonous to other predators that might try to eat them. Uh, the monarch caterpillar itself is pretty colorful. And that actually tells predators being like, beware, don't eat me. Um, it protects them uh, because they can eat that and consume that milkweed. So an egg are very, very tiny, and it's even uh, pretty difficult to spy one of those um, one of those eggs on the bottom of a milkweed leaf. Uh, an egg is generally on the underside of the milkweed and a female monarch will kind of make a C shape with their body to glue that egg in place. Um, and once it's there, they don't tend to fall off. They're very sticky and an egg will, uh, it will take about three to five days, days for that egg to um, hatch out or uh, emerge caterpillars will actually eat the eggshell as their first meal. So rather than hatching out and leaving that egg alone, it's actually something that they eat uh, to provide them with nutrients and strength. Um, but other than that, they're gonna be eating that milkweed. So when they hit that caterpillar stage, um, monarchs and other caterpillars are 
uh, really interesting because they grow at such a fast rate. Um, from the time they're born or emerge from that egg, they're teeny tiny, and then they can grow about 2,700 times their size. If we were to think about that as a human, a, a baby, that would mean they're growing the same size as a school bus by the time they're full grown. Um, so they eat and eat and eat so they can get big, and eventually, they're going to hit the pupating stage where they're going to go into their chrysalis. And um, the way the monarch does this is they need to find a really safe place to hang their chrysalis. Um, they won't do it on just anything. It needs to be a horizontal surface and it needs to be sturdy so they feel safe. And what they'll do is they'll do a walkabout. So they'll walk pretty far until they're ready to hang that jay and to pupate or make that chrysalis. Um, monarchs can actually do their walkabout. They can walk the same distance as a full football field until they're ready to make their J. Um, once they make their J, they will do that pupating dance and slowly that uh, monarch or that kill it caterpillar, I should say, will turn directly into a chrysalis. Um, and the chrysalis of a monarch, it's a green like jade color and there's actually gold pieces on it. So it's very easy to identify if, you, if you're lucky enough to see one in nature. After um, they emerge, uh, about 10 to 14 days in that chrysalis they're gonna that that jade color will actually turn into a see-through color where we can see the monarch in their chrysalis that jade color has now turned to something like an orange black white and you're gonna see those monarch colors meaning they're ready to come out um and be an adult monarch butterfly which is pretty cool so again there's the four stages that those monarch butterflies go through and um, we call that metamorphosis. Now, out of all those, you know, with habitat and the combination of um, the monarch life cycle, out of the 300 eggs a female may lay, lay only 1% or three of those uh, one or three of those 300 eggs are actually going to survive. So it's a very small chance that all of those um, those eggs will make it to an adult butterfly. What I'm gonna do here is we're gonna bring Andalyn into the picture and she's gonna show off and maybe talk to you a little bit about the monarch butterflies she's hosting. Sure, hey everyone. So let's bring out some of our butterfly guests here. Um, just uh, if you're wondering how do I have butterflies in the middle of winter, at least up here in Ontario, it's pretty chilly outside. There's not butterflies around. These actually came from the tropical jungle. So these are monarchs that are from Costa Rica. They do get monarch butterflies down there as well. And I'm going to bring one up close. I'm being very careful and gentle. It's okay to touch a butterfly. If you're careful, you don't want to do it all the time. But I just kind of also want to spread open the wings here. And um, you can see the patterns that Carly was mentioning, those nice black and white dots in the corners. And we might talk more about this shortly, but I'm holding a boy monarch and I can tell because on the hind wing, do you see there's one black dot there and another one here? You can tell boys from girls as a monarch butterfly. And I just have them hanging out in this fun cage. They're drinking nectar from the bottom maybe i can hold up i don't know if you can see through there but they have some yummy sugar water that they're drinking and maybe you'll find out why and how they can drink sugar water uh, afterwards as well okay back to you carly all right thank you so we talked about the life stages we were able to see a real live monarch butterfly which is amazing but now we're going to take an even closer look and just uh get will on here to show us maybe the different tighter parts of the monarch um as an insect uh so will if you want to pop on there Perfect. Awesome. Hello, everybody. So I have a little microscope here and monarch butterflies are insects. So one of the biggest things that we know of insects is how many legs do they have? Insects have how many legs? One, two, three, 13. Well, it's six legs they have. And as an adult monarch, we find those on the underside of them. But they also have a lot of other really cool parts. Now, this here in front of you, I want to take a look at it. When you take a bit of a guess before and talk about it too, what do you think this is in front of us? We're looking at a monarch. It's not alive anymore, but this is a part of a monarch. 
Now I'm using mine. It looks a bit different right now. This is our mouth, we can kind of say, for our monarch. Now it looks pretty cool. This is actually called a proboscis. It's kind of like a straw, it acts like. And it curls up underneath our eyes of our butterfly. And I'll kind of pull that up just a bit. You can see our eyes of it. And it acts like a straw. And it actually starts off as two parts. And they zip it up just like a zipper right at the beginning. And it's really cool. So at the tip, that is where they are drinking from. Now, they're not tasting from their tongue. They're actually tasting from their toes. That's how monarchs will taste. It's pretty cool. So imagine that. You're kind of in class. You're tasting your food with your toes, but you're still eating it with your mouth. It's pretty, pretty crazy, too. So we also can think about our eyes of our insects, right? We have some of our compound eyes. Allows us to see lots of different things. Pretty cool. We have some of our antennae as well. We can go over to this. Whoop. And we can also see some of our wings here along with our scales. And there's a question that was asked in the chat as well about the powder on the wings. Well, for a monarch butterfly, it has scales. If we kind of think of more powder, we're thinking about more about our moths themselves. So it's pretty cool. We can kind of see our scales all on our wing here. And it kind of looks... I'm just going to focus the camera. I apology, apologize, everybody. Oh, we can see all those small squares on the wings. So it's pretty cool what we have here. And we also even have some hair on our monarch as well. So we have hair, we have scales, we have herboscis, which is its mouth. And it kind of tastes with its feet. Pretty cool. I'll pass it back to you, Carly. Thanks so much, Will. So we talk about the life cycles that we know there's four, um, but we also want to know how to ID a monarch um, when they're an adult. Now, here we have, uh, and you were able to see those live monarchs. Again, we see those colors, um, the bright orange, the black veins. Uh, we have the white dots on the monarch butterfly. And the the size of a monarch butterfly can actually range. So it can wingspan can be 63 to 105 millimeters. So these guys are still pretty tiny. Um, and in weight, it's comparable to a chocolate chip. So if you were to think about holding a chocolate chip in your hand, that's about the weight of a monarch butterfly. And Andalyn, she said she was holding up one monarch. Um, if you can remember correctly, it had little black dots on the hind legs of that. So that means that one is a male. Now females look a little bit different. They don't have that little swollen pouch is what we call it, or that black dot that you're seeing on the male hind legs uh, or hind wings, sorry. Um, but you're not, you're seeing a thicker veining um, and they, uh, and less orange. So those are two ways to be able to identify. Um, now, going back to a monarch in the egg stage or a caterpillar stage or the um, chrysalis stage, we actually can't tell if they're female or male. Um, that's something we can only tell once they've reached that adult butterfly stage. So the last thing we want to talk about, and probably the coolest thing we're going to talk about today, is that migration. So I mentioned the weight of a chocolate chip, a monarch butterfly, is going to make their migration um, to overwinter in Mexico, um, in central Mexico, Mexico, in the forest there. Uh, and this could be 4,000 to 4,800 kilometers. Um, so the longest migrating insect, uh, which is just really cool to think about. I know that if I was to try and say, oh, I'm going to walk to Mexico, I don't know if I could do it as a human, but monarchs are able to do that. Now, the other inter interesting thing about monarchs are birthdays are really important. Um, and you're probably like, why, Carly? Why would birthdays be something that's important to a monarch? Well, monarchs that are born er uh, or in May, June, July, they live to about three to five weeks as a grown adult monarch butterfly. But the monarchs that migrate to Mexico, so these ones are the ones that end of August, it's getting a little chilly and they know it's time to fly away. They live up to eight months long, um, long enough to make it all the way to Mexico. Now, the monarch butterfly, once it arrives in Mexico um, in late October, 
they winter there in the tops of the trees high in the mountains in central Mexico. Um, and then after resting for a few months, uh, what they'll do is those monarchs will make their way back to Canada, going through the states, um, and they might. So the first of those might uh, return, or the first of those might stop in Texas to find their habitat source. Again, that would be milkweed. So they can lay their eggs, they can eat, and again, they will pass away. But those eggs um, and those ones that hatch and survive will continue that migration back to Canada. So when we think about that migration, the monarchs that leave Canada at the end of summertime, they never make their way back to Canada. It's their great, great grandchildren that do. Um, now, scientists haven't really nailed down exactly how monarchs are able to find their way home, um, but they believe that it has to do with using the sun or their own magnetic compass. So um, you probably are wondering as a class or as a student, well, I've learned all these things about monarchs. I know there are species at risk and are needing help. Um, so what could you do? Well, you can take part in a citizen and science project. And what I have up here is from monarchmission.org. Um, and teachers, you can access this for your students. But uh, when it's warm out or summer and when we start to see monarchs again, if you're in Ontario, um, you can actually record if you find milkweed or if you see a monarch. Now, Andalyn is very trained. She, she was uh, holding those monarchs. And same with Will. They do have a certificate and special training to hold those monarchs or raise those monarchs. Um, but as students, what you can do is you can make those observations and then send them back to Monarch Mission. And they're going to be able to verify where they're seeing monarchs, how many monarchs they're seeing. And it's really helpful for science. The other thing you can do is help directly by planting more um, habitat for monarchs. Now, um, we always suggest milkweed because that's what they need to survive. They need it to eat. They need to lay their eggs. Um, it is their main source of food and their only source of food as a caterpillar. Um, but you can also do any other pollinator plants or plants that would help them um, where they can get nectar as that adult butterfly. So we always recommend uh, just getting involved. If you have a small balcony, you can put milkweed up and put it in a planter. Or if you have a big backyard, you know, think about putting those pollinator or native plants in your area to support um, the monarch butterfly or other insect species. Um, now I guess it's time to move to a Q&A. We had Will up on YouTube answering your questions as best he could, but he's gonna join back and um, Andalyn can also be here. And if there's any questions, um, I guess Jesse will facilitate that. Fantastic, well Carly, thank you so, so much. So I'll bring back Will and Andalyn. Will, if you wanna monitor YouTube as well, we will be getting more questions over the next 20 minutes. We've got over 15 full classrooms, so it's like 350, 400 kids from across the continent. So welcome into all of you guys. What I'm gonna do is mainly focus on our live classes today and then YouTube we can cover in another way. And whatever your questions uh, go towards, we'll make sure Carly, Andalyn, or Will get the appropriate questions. So I'm gonna start with Mr. Reed's kindergarten class joining us in Stony Creek, Ontario. Mr. Reed, if you wanna come on in, go for it and kick us off. Well, hi, and thanks for uh, inviting us today. It's uh, been very informative. Um, my class had a, had a bunch of different questions, and one of them was, with the long journey, I mean, humans sleep to get rest, but do butterflies do anything of that sort? Do they rest during their long journey to Mexico? So why don't we do it where, Carly, you start off with questions and we'll sort of do one question for Perfect. each other. Perfect, sounds good. <laughs> answers, which is great. So Carly, kick us off. Yeah, I did mention that monarchs, um, if they're migratory monarchs, they're gonna be able to live a lot longer, up to eight months um, to make that migratory. Um, now monarchs will rest. I don't know exactly about their sleeping patterns, but as any monarch would, they're going to have to break and find um, food sources along their route. So if they're leaving somewhere like Ontario and then going through the states, they are going to need those food sources and they will land on uh, plants to rest. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know exactly about their sleeping pat patterns. Maybe Will or Andlin know, but they definitely do need rest uh, and that food source to make that journey. Andlin, any additional insight? Yeah, I could share two other fun facts related to that. 
one, they do have to sleep and they rest. Um, they would sleep definitely over nighttime, tucked in a flower or hanging from a tree. So they will do that. And also, uh, the second fun thing, they're really smart. They're not just actively flapping the whole time. I mean, if they flapped and flew all the way to Mexico, that would use up a lot of energy. So they actually try to glide on the air currents as much as possible and let the wind help push them. Very, very cool. Thanks, ladies. All right, let's head to Ms. Baquero's class, joining us in Merida in Mexico. If you want to demute your microphone and come on in for a question, go for it. Hi. Hi. Okay. I was one of my students is wondering, like, how can you grab a butterfly? Like, what does all your training entitle? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll let Andalyn take that one. Tell us all about it. <laughs> sure. Well, I did go to university to learn all about insects and the proper way to handle them. But I, I do work with butterflies for a living. As I said, you want to be very gentle and careful. Maybe you saw I was kind of only trying to hold a butterfly with two fingers. I'm not rubbing my fingers all over them because I don't want to rub off all those scales or the powder. I try not to touch their feet as much as possible because remember Will said they taste with the bottom of their feet. They're really sensitive to chemicals. Um, lotion, alcohol, like hand sanitizer or anything. So you don't just always want to go picking up a butterfly or a bug that way. So that kind of all factors into the, the proper way to handle them. Yeah. And I think that that's a really important message. So you can do it because you have that training, you have that backdrop, but we don't want kids heading out and trying to grab monarchs. It's something where you can really enjoy them by looking at them, even looking at them really up close, and then save it to the professionals for something that you pick up. This is something that applies to a lot of animals in the wild. Just look, but don't touch works for a lot of plants as well. But very cool to see that up close, Andalyn, and uh, really nice to see someone who really knows what they're doing so we can see it in close. Thank awesome. You. All right, I'm going to go to Mr. Greenfield's class. He's joining us in Freehold, New Jersey. I think over our course of our five years, we've had every single school in Freehold, New Jersey take part. So it's always a pleasure having him in. Uh, and yes, Mr. Greenfield, if you want to share your screen and try and uh, bring your kids in for the question directly, go for it. Yes, I'm going to do that right now. And thank you, as always, for organizing this and having our class. Um, Amelia, in just a moment, um, I'm going to have you ask your question. So I'm sharing my screen now with them. Perfect. Uh, Jesse, can you see my class? I sure can. Amelia, go for it. Go ahead, Amelia. You may need to unmute your mic. Let's see. Nice to see you guys, by the way. Hello to everybody. <laughs> Amelia, did you have that question for us? Maybe kind of, sort of. Mr. Greenfield, do you know what the question is from Amelia? It's not coming through? Yep, I will uh, I will say it now in case we're having uh, issues with the sound. No worries, go for it. All right, so it looks like uh, the question that she wanted to ask was, uh, what food did a monarch butterflies eat and how do they smell or do they smell the food? Fantastic, Will, I'm gonna turn to you to answer this one. We're gonna go again one by one through everyone. So Will, what do you think? So what monarch butterflies eat, a big part of, so answering our first part there is a lot of their energy or what, what they eat is in stored energy is when they're a caterpillar. So all of that eating, and I kind of call them eating machines when they're a caterpillar, all they're doing during that time is they're just eating milkweed. They're just eating and eating and eating, and they're storing that energy for when they're an adult. How they get that additional food is by drinking nectar through their proboscis, and I'll kind of pull that up here again through their proboscis, drinking that nectar in those plants. And a big way how they can tell uh, what they'd like to eat is by tasting it with their feet. So they'll kind of land on the plant and they will kind of taste it and say, mm, is this something I'm going to like? And they will extend their proboscis, unravel it, and they will drink directly from there. It's pretty neat. I actually have a picture of one here. This is actually uh, my backyard and I have a common milkweed here. You can see it's pink kind of flowers and it's landed on it. It's using its feet to taste and it will unravel its proboscis to eat the food or drink it. We can kind of say like a straw. Hopefully that answers our question there. 
That's perfect. Thank you so much, Will. I'd encourage all our students actually to go home and see if they can taste things with their feet later on after this broadcast and then go from there. Um, so Will's also answering a lot of questions on YouTube. So Will, thank you so much for that, for all our teachers sharing on YouTube. It's a great way to get your answers there. Um, what I'm going to do now is go to Miss McNeil's class. Miss McNeil is joining us in Lethbridge, Alberta. Welcome in Miss McNeil's class with actual students in an actual classroom. Oh, it makes me happy every time. Go for it, guys. Hi. <laughs> Where do they keep that poison toxin in their body? Yeah. All right. Carly, can you answer that one for us? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we talked about milkweed being poisonous, but monarchs are still able to consume it or eat it as a caterpillar. Um, and that's really a defense mechanism. I think if I was a teeny tiny like a monarch caterpillar and there were things like birds around me that might think I look really good to eat, well... Um, monarch butterflies are poisonous. And really how uh, those predators are warned are those birds that might think, mm, I'm looking for something to eat. Well, they see those colors and they say, oh no. Um, well, the caterpillar uh, being as bright as it is with the yellow, white and black stripes, it says that looks a little dangerous. And that's exactly what it is. It's a warning. So in combination, you're getting their colors to say, stand away or back off, don't eat me. But you're also uh, the actual caterpillar itself, because it eats so much milkweed, um, is poisonous, which is a, a way to protect themselves. Yeah, super cool question. I was wondering when we were going to get that one. So thanks to Miss McNeil, student. All right, what we're going to do now is go to Miss Semino's class. Joining us in Sudbury, we've had so many groups in Sudbury the last few weeks. Welcome back in. Just demute that microphone, and you are good to go. Hi guys. Hi. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks for having us. We have a question from Oliver. Hey, Oliver. Go can, for it. Can caterpillars, after they just uh -huh. hatch out of their eggs, go to Mexico? Yeah. Well, I'm going to take us to Andalyn to answer that one because it's been a while for her and she's got some monarchs right in front of her. So, Andalyn, what do you think? You're, you're crawling out of the egg or you're flying to Mexico instantly? What's going on? Good question. Well, when a baby caterpillar hatches out of the egg, it is so small. It's the size of a sprinkle. So I think it's a little too teeny to make that big journey all the way to Mexico. So it has to eat and grow, go from the size of a sprinkle to about, well, the size of my pinky finger. And then it needs to go through that chrysalis stage to get the wings. And only after it gets the wings, will it fly down to Mexico. So it still has, it has to wait, you know, about three or four weeks and grow up before it can make the journey. Yeah. Very, very cool though. And I love thinking about this, you know, the speed of development for a lot of animals. I mean, imagine when you guys were three weeks old, could you make the trip all the way to Mexico from Canada? I don't think so. It takes a little bit longer. So very cool question, guys. What we're going to do now is go to another round of questions. We're whipping through these. Great time, guys. Will's going to keep checking out things on YouTube and I am going to head back to Mr. Reed's class in Stony Creek. Come on back in, Mr. Reed, and take us away. Well, thank you again. Um, so, we had many questions, and uh, one had to do with the uh, like length of the journey. It's thousands of kilometers. So, how many days does the monarch butterfly uh, like stay for in Mexico after it makes the journey? Yeah, Carly. That yeah, I actually do. So when they leave, uh, a monarch butterfly arrives in Mexico in late October, and it's not until March that they would start to make their way back to uh, come back to Canada for springtime. So they are overwintering for quite a long period, um, a couple months. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks, Mr. Reed. Um, by the way, for anyone who wants to chart that butterfly migration, see one of our past programs, both uh, Alana Wilcox and Greg Mitchell. Both of you go to our YouTube channel, type in those names, Alana Wilcox, Greg Mitchell. Uh, we did amazing programs of them featuring more on that migration, seeing some of those monarchs in Mexico. It is super cool. Some of the best things I've ever seen in my life personally, and I'd really encourage you guys to check that out. Speaking of Mexico, we're going to go back to Merida for Ms. Becaro's class. Welcome in, and uh, yeah, demute that mic. You're good to go. Hi. Okay. We had another question. Um, how come only 1% of those eggs that the female butterfly has, only 1% survive? How come yeah. it can't be a little bit more? Yeah. So, Will, I know you've been having so much fun on YouTube, but I want to, we want to see your face. So I'm going to bring you back in and you can answer that one. Go for Perfect. it, Perfect. Yeah, I actually... Uh... 
was uh, just typing a whole bunch of different things in YouTube and keep the questions coming. So 1% of the eggs, so we kind of mentioned before, right, about th the female monarch will lay up to 300 eggs. A big part of it is predation. So other animals eating maybe the egg or the caterpillar, uh, lots of different insects. Uh, if we can think of uh, even wasps, there are spiders, there are lots of different animals that may eat them. A big other part of it too is if it's along roadsides or near farmer's fields that use chemicals or pesticides, monarch butterflies in their caterpillar stage may eat that and then it will affect them and they cannot survive. That's a big thing that happens too. There are diseases as well that affect monarchs. And in places like Texas, or if we even think of Florida, where there isn't that cold that kind of kills all the plants, it's warm kind of all year round, there's something called... Um, oh, why am I forgetting it right now? Uh, it's, um, uh, Adeline, what is it called again? It's, I'm forgetting it. I'm forgetting it. What's that monarch? Okay, what's the question again? OE. OE is oh, what it's called. Oh, the parasite. Called. Yeah, a parasite that is a big factor uh, that kills monarch butterflies um, throughout North America. So it's something that kind of is on the plants. A monarch will eat it, and it actually affects them. So a very small percentage of monarchs do survive. So that's why we're saying, and a big part of how can we help is planting that habitat. It's pretty neat. And then hopefully at some point, it's kind of hard to see sometimes, but we may be able to see actually a chrysalis and it emerge too. So it's pretty cool to get to experience and see one that does survive as well. Very, very cool. What a great picture. So now, of course, today we've been joined by the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory. If you happen to be in the Cambridge area when the world's back open up again, do head there. It's an amazing organization. Uh, but a lot of butterfly conservatories exist across the continent. So if you ever get a chance to see a chrysalis or see a butterfly emerge from a chrysalis, it's one of the coolest experiences you can have in nature. I would really encourage you to check that out when the world opens up, as I said. All right, we're going to head back to New Jersey. Mr. Greenfield, we will bring in your class. If you want to screen share and show them again, it's nice to say hi and see them. And maybe you can share the question on their behalf. So come on in and you're good to go. All right. Um, I'm going to defer to Peyton here. Peyton, you just asked the question about the 1%. Um, I'm going to see, I think, you know, because I was screen sharing over your screen share, the volume probably didn't pick it up. But Peyton, you want to try and unmute yourself and ask that question. And if I don't hear you in a few seconds, I'll just ask it for you. Hey, Peyton, welcome in. Um, why do only one of the percent of like the 300 eggs survive if they're... So like, do they have... Um, why do only 1% of the butterflies can be alive, but the, out of the 300 eggs? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so, Randall, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> sure. Um, as Will was kind of mentioning, there are a lot of things that will eat or um, predate on the eggs and the caterpillars and even the butterfly. And so that's why the female... The mother monarch is going to lay as many as she can, knowing that not many of them are going to make it all the way back up to being the adult butterfly again. And that's just the circle of life. Well, it's interesting. So, I mean, a lot of our programs, we feature a lot of mammals, a lot of birds in this program. And so we're mammals. When we have babies, we have a few of them and we put a lot of resources in, make sure that they live, grow up nice and healthy. A lot of animals don't do that. Certainly fish, a lot of invertebrates will have tons and tons of babies in the hopes that some of them will eke it out and survive. Again, we see this when we do Ripley's Aquarium programs. We talk about baby seahorses, a lot of things like that. So there's two really distinct strategies for creatures in nature, and monarchs fall into that category that's a little bit different than ours. Great question, guys. All right, Miss McNeil's class with a student at the camera waiting. Miss McNeil's class, go for it. Hi. <laughs> Why do uh, monarch butterflies lay their eggs uh, on uh, milkweeds and only eat milkweeds? Yeah. Carly, can you answer that for us? Well, they have to lay their eggs on the milkweed because if they don't lay their eggs on the milkweed, um, they won't be able to survive. Uh, when a small, tiny caterpillar hatches out of its egg, and Andalyn said it's the size of a sprinkle, which is a great comparison, it can't move or find that milkweed at that point. So by being on that milkweed, when it comes out of its 
its egg, it can start eating. And again, like Will said, it just eats, 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 and poops and eats and eats and eats and more. Uh, so they can grow all that grow and then have all that energy to make the trip or be an adult um, butterfly. Now, um, the second part to that was why do they only eat milkweed? Um, that's just what they do. Uh, that's the the species specifically. I know it sounds a little funny because if as humans we said, oh, I'm only going to eat one thing for the rest of my life, that doesn't sound very good. I know I like a bunch of different things. So it's a bit strange when we think about it in a human perspective, but for those animal species, they only eat uh, very specific food. When we think of other species as well, um, you know, birds, um, our dogs, you know, different animals, everyone has a different diet. So uh, monarchs are eating milkweed. That's the only thing they eat. And if they don't have it, unfortunately, they just won't survive. So it's really important for that milkweed to be planted. That was a great question. Yeah, great question, guys. For me personally, if I could only eat eggs Benedict every day for the rest of my life, that would be quite okay with me. So I encourage our kids, think about the one food. If you had to be like a monarch and only eat milkweed, what would be your thing? Hopefully not actually milkweed for you guys. Pick something a little bit better. We are going to go over one more question live. Uh, back to Miss Semino's class, and then we'll wrap up from there. Time flies, and we are having fun. Miss Semino, just demute that microphone, and you are good to go. Hi, guys. <laughs> I like the wave, like every kid in the class. It's amazing. <laughs> we have Andrew asking a question. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hi. Okay, talk. Why do they eat too much? Why do they eat too much? Do they eat too much? Yeah. yeah. Man, awesome. And Alyn, why are they eating so much? Why are they so greedy? <laughs> they're, flies? Well, they're eating machines, like Will said. They uh, and I mean, think of eating nothing but salad for your whole life. Eating just lettuce, it maybe isn't the most nutritious. So I mean, just eating leaves, you got to eat an awful lot of them to get. So that's just what they do. <laughs> it's exactly again. This is why I eat eggs Benedict as opposed to salad, is I get so much energy from all that hollandaise sauce. It's so good. Um, but I digress. Guys, this has been so, so much fun. Again, over 15 classrooms joining on YouTube are five live from across the, the continent. We've got Mexican classes. We've got five states, two provinces, and more. Thank you so, so much for joining. What I want to do now before we wrap up and say a big thank you to all our speakers is just share a bunch of links that you guys can use to keep the learning going. So if you want to learn about the Monarch Nation program, head to monarchnation.ca. More amazing information there on both monarchs in general and what you can do to help protect them. The Toronto Region Conservation Authority Generally, you can find it trca.ca, very easy website. Check that out. They do a bunch of amazing programs here in the general Toronto area, and their work is widely applicable across North America, wherever you're joining from. We've got Mission Monarch, which Carly showed us at the end of her broadcast, so do check that out. Again, great ways that you guys as a classroom can help monarch butterflies. And finally, Andalyn is joining us from the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory, so check out cambridgebutterfly.com, amazing organization where you can go and see all these amazing processes in person. So with that, I'm going to bring in all our speakers, Carly, Andalyn, and Will. Thank you so much for joining. And what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our classrooms so they can say a big thank you and goodbye as well. So, Mr. Reed, Ms. McCarroll, Mr. Greenfield, Ms. McCarroll. So much. You know, what a wonderful trip. <laughs> for all the good information. Oh, thank you for your